My name is Monk Grove for the Phileas Jazz Archive, and it's a great pleasure to have John Altman with me today that um, from one continent to the other. Yep, delighted to be here. I was reading uh, lengthy descriptions of your career and watching videos, and this phrase came into my head, and I'm going to try it out on you. And the phrase is, John Altman is the Quincy Jones of England, and Quincy <laughs> Jones is the John Altman of America. Uh, I'm very flattered. Uh, I, I, I was introduced to him by Benny Carter, who um, I used to spend every Thursday with when I was in Los Angeles. And he kept saying to me, do you know Quincy Jones? And I went, well, I know who he is, but I don't know him. And the following week, he'd say, do you know Quincy Jones? And I thought, you know, I've got to make allowances. He's, you know, 90 something and getting on. And uh, maybe he doesn't remember what I said last time. Then he had a birthday party, sat me next to Quincy Jones. So I, I, I knew there was method in his madness. <laughs> I'm trying to imagine what you and Quincy Jones would would talk about. I I had made an assumption early on in this project that musicians, when they get together, always talk about music. And then I overheard a conversation once with a Frank West and Joe Williams and a number of other fellows like that. And they weren't talking about music at all. Yeah. Well, funnily enough, um, the great thing about talking with Quincy was I happened to mention Lucky Thompson straight off the bat, which of course set him off. And all he wanted to talk about was the Lionel Hampton band and Clifford Brown and Jimmy Cleveland. And it, it was, um, I'm sure everybody else at the table, I mean, it was a big event and we talked the whole evening and, um, I don't think we got any later than 1956. And it, it was wonderful, you know, because I, I suppose nobody ever spoke to him about that anymore. You know, it was always Michael Jackson or Off the Wall or one of those sort of events. So to go back and have somebody mention Lucky Thompson and Clifford Brown and Gigi Grice was quite a shock, I think. Well, I want to go back with you. Um because I I read that you came from a musical family and your uncles were in the business. Mm -hmm. Were you fascinated early on by how much did you witness of what they did? And was it something that seemed like, oh, yes, I want to do that? Yeah, it was very interesting. I mean, my older uncle, I mean, there were four brothers and they were all band leaders and they'd all played different instruments. Uh, two of them became, I I would say sort of household names in England, certainly, but also surprisingly in America. Um, my uncle Sid Phillips was our leading arranger and jazz clarinet player. He wound up playing with Louis Armstrong's UK All-Stars, but um, he'd gone to New York for Irving Mills, he was the Am Ambrose Band arranger, which was a very popular dance band, both here in the States. And Irving Mills, who had his publishing, invited him to New York, where he recorded with an amazing, I've, I've got the recordings, an amazing New York session band, which is better, basically the Saturday Night Swing Club band. But he also was jamming with Bunny Berrigan and, uh, Bobby Hackett and Bud Freeman. And he actually introduced Artie Shaw to Buddy Rich, whom he heard in playing in a club with, I, I think it might've been Bobby Hackett or Adrian Rolini or someone like that. And he said to Artie Shaw, oh, you want to hire this guy? He's really great. And um, he also convinced Chapels, the publishers, to, to take on Jerry Gray, who they'd never heard of before all the Glenn Miller stuff. So very interesting guy. And after the war, he led Britain's leading Dixieland band. And then my youngest uncle, Wolf Phillips, conducted at the London Palladium. So he 
actually conducted the band for Duke Ellington and Benny Goodman. So, because of the union regulations, they weren't allowed to bring their own bands. So um, Duke Ellington played with my uncle's band with him leading it. So um, Ellington would thereafter introduce him as my band leader, which was uh, wonderful. Well, where do you go from there? You go from there. And my childhood acquaintances were Nat King Cole and Judy Garland and the Andrews sisters and Sophie Tucker, Jack Benny. So without knowing who they were, I was being imbued with this culture of music, you know, you, you show business, music. And um, it just seemed like a natural thing to me. And then I would see my uncles playing music on television because they appeared a lot on British TV. And somewhere it, it was always, well, you know, I, I think I want to do that. It was never a, in any question that I wouldn't be playing an instrument. Were your parents on board with that direction they saw you going in? Oh, yeah. I mean, my mother played wonderful stride piano, which she learned by looking over her brother's shoulder. And my youngest uncle learned to arrange by looking over his brother's shoulder. So um, at the age of 14, he was writing for the Ambrose Band, which is... Quite extraordinary. He was um, a staff arranger at Lawrence Wright at the age of 14. So there's a musical gene in the family that runs all the way through to my kids, to my cousin was the drummer with Toto for 30 odd years. You know, it, it it's gone all the way through and carried on, which is amazing. Was, was, the, sax the, was the saxophone your first choice of instruments? I started uh, playing piano when I was seven and I had lessons till the age of 11. And then I stopped because I changed teacher and the teacher basically said, well, you're doing everything incorrectly. You know, your posture is wrong. Your hand position is wrong. Your timing is wrong. We're going to start again from the beginning. And I, was, I wasn't having any of that. So I gave up the piano and at the age of 12, 13, I just thought I, I want to play the saxophone. And uh, my uncle brought round a, a sort of cheap Selma and showed me what to do on the Friday night. And on the Saturday night, I played a gig. <laughs> oh, come on. You, you can't make this stuff up. So, well, I already played the recorder, you see. So okay, so you had sort of a... Sort of where where one's fingers went, you know, but I, I can't even imagine what I played. I think Green Onions in the key of concert key of E, you know, is about the limit that I could manage. <laughs> I was curious. Um, there's anecdotes that you've shared about probably not that long after that, sitting in with, with some of the the now well-known rock bands. Mm. You'd, go, you'd go to a club and did you have to like make your way through uh, the bouncers and the manager or whatever? No, the interesting thing is there weren't any in those days. And we're talking about, you know, bands like Fleetwood Mac and John Mayles Blues Breakers and even sort of Jimi Hendrix Experience would be playing in local bars, you know, in the back room or upstairs. There were no, no dressing rooms, let alone bouncers. And uh, you'd see someone at the bar and you'd take your tenor along or I'd take my tenor along and I'd say, can I play with you? And quite usually they would say, yeah, sure. And it wasn't a case of, well, we know who you are, so come and join us. It was more a case of, well, we'll give you one tune and if you're no good, we'll kick you off. And if you can play, we'll ask you to stay for the whole evening. And once you've got to know them, you played maybe one solo or something. And they went, oh, this guy's all right. At the end of the evening, they'd say, we're playing at another club next Saturday. Why don't you join us? Or I've got another band, come and play with them. Or my friend's band are so-and-so, tell them that you played with us and join in. So I built up this whole circle of jamming and I, I always say I was very lucky because I went to university on a full grant. So I didn't need to turn professional. 
I could go and jam with whoever I felt like. And it wasn't an economic necessity to go on tour with the soul band or play in a holiday camp for the whole summer. I would I would show up at gigs or or even at university. My my roommate was social secretary, so I got him to book all the people I could play with. A steal. Well, yeah. when, when you got up on the stage, would they usually call one of their originals or would they do like a blues or something so that it would be a blues mainly, yes. Yeah. And then you basically would be in that position where, I mean, obviously a lot of people would get up and they would try and show off because they would go, oh, I've got I've got two choruses to show that I'm a genius, you know? <laughs> I never had that feeling. I always felt, well, you know, I've got to fit in and contribute to what they're doing. Therefore, I'm going to play, you know, within myself, but make it musical and make it make sense. I always had that sort of notion in my head that I would do that rather than, you know, show off or do something technical that people go, wow, he's technically good. Yeah, or cover up the singer. Oh, yeah, that, that was the other thing. I mean, I, I was actually on one gig where the singer turned to me and said, can you please go and shut that other guy up? <laughs> he won't stop playing, you know. So um, I, I was very lucky, I think, you know. Yeah. To build up that series of contacts before I actually knew that I was going to go professional. And then I'm going to guess that down the road, you crossed paths again with some of these same musicians in a different context. Oh, always, yes. I mean, very early on, I, I as a sax player, I decided that it'd be a good idea to learn to play the flute and clarinet, not because I wanted to be in a big band or anything like that, but if I played the flute, I could go to the folk clubs and play with um, the up and coming Nick Drakes and John Martins and people like that who populated the London folk scene. And if I played the clarinet, I could do Dixieland gigs, which I started doing. So it was very schizophrenic. You know, one day I'd be on a blues scene or even the same day. Then I'd go to a folk club and then I'd do a Dixieland gig later on. But I, I was voracious. I loved music. Music was everywhere. You were, getting, um, um, you were getting on the job training for your composing and your arranging and oh, your totally. symphony. Yeah. Like uh, yeah. it all was going into your head. Very interesting story. There was a, a bass player in London called John Hart, who was part of, I believe he was part of the Woolworths family. So at that time, he was very well off and had a very large house in one of the best parts of London. And Philly Joe Jones came to live with him. It's extraordinary. I mean, I think it was because there was access to to drugs on the national health, you know, so he could register as an addict and he didn't have to be hounded by the police or anything like that. But he took up residence in this house in Hampstead and he couldn't work because he didn't have a permit, but he could teach and he could run jam sessions. So I got invited at the age of 16 to a jam session and I'd been playing for three years and there were the best horn players in the country, all lining up, all trying to impress Philly Joe Jones. You know? And we started playing the blues and it got to me and I was panicking. I was going, I I can't do a five chorus Coltrane impersonation, you know. I, I oh, what am I gonna do? Oh, I'll play one note. Uh, I'll play it again and add another one. Oh, I'll play it again, add a third one and then I'll invert it. Hang on a minute. This is what you do. And at, at the end of the number, he came over to me and said, you play like Joe Henderson. He ignored everybody else and came over. And I thought, now I understand improvisation. Now I know what the musicality of being an improviser actually is, rather than, oh, I've got 16 ways to get from a, a D major seventh to a, to a G without, you know, playing every substitution in the book. <laughs> so it was on the job. And 
as an as a coda to that, uh, several years later, obviously on the advice of Philly Joe, Hank Mobley showed up in this house. Ah, uh, one of my favourites. Mm. Oh, me too. And I got a phone call from John Hart, who sadly we lost very young um, in a car crash. And he rang me and said, uh, Hank Mobley would like to borrow your tenor. And I said, oh. <laughs> he said, yes, he's arrived. He hasn't brought one. I said, oh, uh, what reeds and mouthpieces he got? And he said, oh, no, he brought nothing. He wants the lot. <laughs> I thought, no, not for me. And I passed. You passed. I think I would too. <laughs> well, Ronnie Scott right wound up lending him a horn, you know, but um, in later years, I told the story to Jimmy Heath. And he said to me, oh, you'd never have seen that again. <laughs> <laughs> it would have found its way to a pawn shop, eh? Oh, yes, exactly. And he said, I won't name the wonderful tenor player that Jimmy named, but I'm sure you can guess who it was. He said he used to borrow my horn. I used to go to the gig, stand at the side of the stage and walk home with him. <laughs> See. <laughs> so you had a... You had a free ticket at a university, yet, um, if this is correct, you gave it up to go with um, hot chocolate. Is that correct? Uh, it was a couple of years later. I, I came back to London and was doing a research degree. And then I got a phone call asking if I'd like to join the group Hot Chocolate, who at the time were the number one singles band uh, after the Beatles. And um, I, I don't know if I thought well, that's my prof next profession or anything like that. And it never, I thought, oh, that'd be fun to do a a year or a tour or a couple of tours with them, which it turned out to be, you know, two years of, of great fun. Did you find that in that situation, you kept getting asked to do more things and you just figured out how to do them? Pretty much, yes, because... It looking back now, it's very interesting because it's all around the same time. I'd done some playing. I started recording when I was 19, which seems ridiculous because I was still at university. But uh, I recorded with the Monty Python team in 1973 and got sort of sucked into their inner circle. So I was with them. I was arranging for very simplistically for for records um and having some success i was arranging hot chocolate stage act i then started writing for the bbc doing takedowns because that i had a very good ear and in those days acts like the stylistics for example or country artists would come to england and they wouldn't bring any music they probably didn't have it uh didn't they hadn't been at their recording session so if there was a full string section on a, on a record i would have to listen to the record and adapt it for whatever show they were coming to do so all these things were going on at the same time and then i started writing for commercials you you used the word takedowns so you meaning like using your ear to take something off a record and recreate it Yes, I would get a cassette from the record company. And first of all, I would write down what I heard on the record. And then I would adapt it for whatever show they were going on. So if they went on a variety show and they said, we've only got two woodwinds or something like that, I would then condense the arrangement to fit that, that lineup. So it was an interesting, interesting time. Were you able to ask um, your uncles about this arranging? Like, gee, a tenor sax sounds, uh, where does it sound actually on the staff? And the, the, the minutia of arranging and knowing how to use instruments. It, I mean, it sounds awful to say, but it was just something I always knew. I mean, even when I was seven years old. I would hear a, maybe a, a symphony and go, oh, um, there's a bassoon doubling the cellos, but it stops after eight bars. 
oh, hello, there's a, a flute and a clarinet in octave unisons. So I never, I never had an arranging lesson in my life. And I didn't read a book. I mean, I, I eventually got a book just to make sure what on earth I was doing might work. And I just looked at the book. I think it's the Walter Piston book. And I went, well, hang on a minute. I know that. Well, I do that anyway. Well, why am I reading the book? Like, like the piano lesson. <laughs> like, yeah. you're doing this wrong. But um, did you, at that time, you would have been using a pencil and a score pad. Yeah. Did you write your scores in concert key or were they transposed yeah. already? No, I wrote them in concert. I still do. I still do. <laughs> I still do. <laughs> At what point were you lucky enough to get a copyist? Uh, really early on, actually, because um, I, I became the uh, sort of arranger in chief for a band called the Pasadena Roof Orchestra, who were a 1920s revival band. And they did a lot of... Um, either original songs of the 20s or takedowns of McKinney's Cotton Pickers or early Ellington. And I'd do both. I'd do original arrangements from scratch, but I'd also take down classic big band charts. When I say big band, I mean pre-swing era charts. And their tuba player did all the copying and he became my copyist basically through 40 odd years. So I, I was never, I was never writing music just for the sake of writing music. It, I was always employed to do stuff. And in fact, the, the Pasadena Roof Orchestra were hired to do the music for a, a film called Just a Gigolo which starred the totally unlikely combination of David Bowie and Marlene Dietrich. So <laughs> if you get your head around that, you can get your head around that. It was a terrible film, but um, basically I was arranging 1920s songs that were fairly obscure, some of them. And when I saw the film, they peppered the whole film with my music. So it became the score of the film. So that was my introduction to movies. Oh, hang on, here it comes again for the fourth time. <laughs> oh, there's a love scene. It's playing behind that. Well, I didn't write it for that, but what the hell? You know? uh, that you're anticipating a question I'm going to ask later about music and emotions and all that. But I want to talk briefly about the, do you call them jingles? Yeah, they can be. I know. I don't feel that I was particularly a jingle composer, although I, ha I have written a couple that have been successful on that front. But mainly there were sort of mini movies with directors like Ridley Scott, um, Hugh Hudson, Alan Parker, John Frankenheimer, and then great photographers like Elliot Erwitt and David Bailey and Terence Donovan. And my lyricist on the few was uh, Salman Rushdie. Oh, God. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm talking about selling um, products. Yeah. Yeah. So if a uh, representative of an ad agency is, you know, having a meeting with you and they're selling paper towels, did you have to learn how to interpret the way they spoke about music into actual music. Oh, absolutely. And I think very helpful for that was my background, academic background in English literature, because I was always looking to try and comprehend subtext of anything that people said. And what was always very interesting was you would often get people saying, I want a jazz track. And that could mean Louis Armstrong, or it could mean Ornette Coleman. <laughs> you know, it, it, I want something classical. Uh, is that Bach or is that Stravinsky? I want uh, country and Western. Do you mean a hoedown or do you mean Dolly Parton? It's, it's very interesting. You, you were constantly trying to narrow people's focus. So if I would go in for a meeting and you, you would, you know, sometimes get 
could you make it green or <laughs> I mean you get some very funny comments that uh, I tried to keep away from the musicians because they would all burst out laughing and so I, I would try and keep them out of the control room I mean what one when they actually did come in sadly uh was for processed cheese and uh I said to the director what do you think he said well um I may be wrong, but it seems to start at the beginning and go all the way through very nicely until the end when it stops. <laughs> and I said, yes, uh, that's about the only way I know how to write music, I'm afraid. <laughs> but you would get, you know, it, he's cording a lot on the bottom string and um, somebody said to the guitarist, um, if I heard a noise in my head, could you play it? <laughs> and he said, well, actually, I had five years medical training. I could probably cure it. <laughs> I love it. Yes, very funny. Were they were they normally like 30 second? Yeah, 30 second, 60 second, 40 second, 10 second, five second. <laughs> Is it harder to write a 10 second spot than a 30 second spot? Well, you really have to, you know, it's a bit like the playing thing that I mentioned earlier. You have to tear your focus right down into that precise moment. It was, I mean, it was a very interesting thing to do. And particularly, for example, I did a lot for New York and my contact was uh, Elliot Lawrence. So Elliot would come over to London and, of course, I'd be talking to him about Donnie Mandel and Al Cohn and Jerry Mulligan. <laughs> and he'd say, well, well, yes, we've got this cop, you know, this, this Ford commercial to do. And I was going, yeah, never mind that. What, what about Benny Goodman? And <laughs> But uh, it was very interesting. Did you ever get carried away with, you're working on a 30 second spot and you write something that you really like and you start adding and expanding and then an alarm goes off and said, all right, remember your task here. Maybe set this aside and make something out of it later. Not so much that, but I did write things that almost got thrown away on. I remember I wrote one thing for um, a, a week long campaign for a national newspaper. It was a special campaign and I always really liked it. So when I got to score a silent movie for the London Film Festival, years later, I, I dredged it up and used it in that, you know, so more that. I mean, I was always focused on the task in hand. In fact, there was one commercial I got asked to shadow. They hired Sir Michael Tippett to, to compose, but they asked me to be in the background advising him on, you know, no, don't do that. <laughs> Very weird, until the moment when he actually turned to me and said, I have no idea how to write a 28 second piece. He said, I can't do it. I just can't do it. And I wound up adapting two pieces of William Walton that bore no relevance to each other. That I thought, well, I mean, this is, you know, this isn't going to go. And of course, the Walton estate gave their permission straight away. I think because of the money that was involved rather than the artistic merit of what I've done. Do you get um, residuals or payments after the fact for any of this kind of work? Yeah. Residuals. Um, obviously, they're more short term because the campaigns don't last years and years and years, generally. Uh-huh. But um, I always got uh, a healthy residual for anything that I did write. Not not as much as the voiceovers, but, <laughs> I but see. from amazing voiceovers, you know, people would come in and you'd, you'd be in awe of uh, who showed up. Or singers. You know, I, I did one with Eartha Kitt. I did one with Mel Torme. It's amazing to look back and think of, well, you know, we did this commercial for soap or breakfast cereal and they flew Earth a kit into London or <laughs> and she called me sir. <laughs> you know, I, I, can, I consider doing that because I wonder that I think you probably should get a knighthood, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> 
I don't know. I'm I'm happy with what I've got. <laughs> you were um there's some marvelous interviews online that I was have watched and I think you were describing a scene from a James Bond movie. And oh, yeah. yeah, and you used the word absurd. So I started thinking about adjectives and what goes through your head after you, you watch a sequence, even before you go to the piano or have a pencil in hand, that might musicalize an adjective like absurd. Mm. Well, I mean, t taking, for example, the, the that particular sequence, which I know is the GoldenEye tank chase, um, I had arranged and conducted the whole score for another composer. And when they did the, um, came to dub the film, they basically weren't happy with what he'd written. And they contacted me and said, would you write something for this? And I said, well, I know what you want, but I won't do it unless the composer is happy because I'm his arranger. And they phoned him and he, I think, grudgingly said, yeah, I'm not going to do it. Let him do it. So the case in point of the sequence was that it was totally absurd. I mean, the scene is that James Bond chases a kidnapped woman through the streets of St. Petersburg in a tank basically ploughing through every building and car and uh, truck loaded with whatever, you know, water. I mean, it, it, it's insanity and totally unrealistic. But it also has to be exciting because it's one of the big moments in the film. Plus, there are mounting points of absurdity through the whole thing. So... The first absurd thing is it bursts through the wall of the prison. The next absurd thing is it it um, does something else. And then just when you think the whole thing's climax, it hits a statue and the statue lands on top of the tank. <laughs> it's driving it. So, I mean, you can't peak within the first couple of minutes. You have to have excitement, but then you have to build the excitement and build the excitement and build the excitement and then build it more. So it's an interesting sequence because it's one of those chases. And we had the similar thing in the new James Bond film that I uh, uh, wrote some brass arrangements for, because there's a whole scene in um, Cuba where there's a big fight. But what they wanted to do was get a sort of salsa Cuban element into the James Bond, Hans Zimmer milieu. So again, it, it was a, an absurd moment that you, you, you have to play on and build and stack up. And then we got Arturo Sandoval to play a solo. And then we got, the, you know, the big brass section, but it's still recognizably Hans Zimmer's music, you know. Uh, that was my, going through my head there, how much do you, have to be aware of what's been written so far by another composer and try not to sound like an obvious um, change of arranger composer. Well, particularly on that Bond theme that I mentioned, um, the scene, it's the only thing I composed in the film. But because I'd orchestrated the rest of the film, I knew tricks that... Um, the original composer had used in his score that subconsciously, I mean, people probably wouldn't have even realised, but I used elements that he had used, like sort of certain percussive things, like a triangle and, uh, you know, subtle touches that would link to what was written in the rest of the score. So you are always thinking in terms of that. You're not going in like a bull in the china shop and going, oh, I do it this way so that you're, what you've done is going to stick out like a... I mean, it stuck out anyway because there was no other brass in the whole film and they hadn't used the Bond theme really through the whole film. So suddenly to have a big brass James Bond moment probably stuck out from the rest of the score anyway, but there's nothing I could do about that. They wanted, they wanted big James Bond, so I gave it to them. 
as an orchestrator, do you usually get a a piano score? What what is given to you? It depends. I mean, there are some composers. For example, um, I orchestrated for Rushi Sakamoto, who is a genius. He basically could have done it all himself. He sketched it out and uh, sent, you know, these days people send synth demos that you take it from. But then I orchestrated for Elmer Bernstein on the film and he, he gave me like two bars and of melody and just <laughs> with no key signature and just said, you know, do whatever you like, <laughs> make it sound good. I hope you got paid more for that one. <laughs> Well, it was nice, you know, when I, when I got to the studio, he said, well, you know what it sounds like. You you go and conduct the band and I'll just sit in the control room. But I, I love working with him because obviously, I mean, you know, how can you not love working with Elmer Bernstein? <laughs> Here's a very specific uh, question. I think you did the music for Garden of Redemption. I did, yeah. And on the end credits, there's this very uh, moving piece of music that probably is is this credit scroll and you had the melody and I, I think it was an English horn do you recall that yes I do yeah and then it was passed to the cello I don't really have a question except it's an observation that it was beautifully done and did you choose the English horn for a particular reason yes is the answer, <laughs> very simple answer. Um, I think interestingly, and this is this is possibly something that doesn't get picked up a lot, as someone who orchestrates and generally orchestrates my own compositions, I always compose thinking of particular sounds or instruments. So to pick a trumpet or a or an English horn or a um, French horn or whatever it might be, is always a deliberate thing in the composition process. Not even when I, so when I orchestrate, I actually know what I'm going to be writing rather than, oh, I wonder what instrument that would sound good on. And it's slightly different, I think, from a lot of composers who will just write something and, th and then, oh, what can I put this on? Yeah, because then you're running into like, oh, that doesn't lie very well on this instrument. Now I've got to fuss with it. So the way no, you're working, yeah. Very true. Very true. And again, with um, if I'm arranging a pop record, for example, I'm always thinking of what the key is, what the what the vocalist is, and what can surround it in a certain way. So, for example, I mean, the interesting one in terms of the pop music was uh, Rod Stewart's version of Downtown Train, the Tom Waits song, because we recorded it in the key of G, and then he found that his voice, because he'd abstained from smoking and worked out and whatever, it was too low. So they very sped it up to B-flat. And this was the days before auto-tune and uh, computerized. I don't know how they did it. But what happened was the entire arrangement sounded weird. It worked, but it was weird. Um, all the vibratos of the strings and woodwind were wrong. They were sort of ethereal, otherworldly. And I'd written for two English horns that were at the top of their range. Once once it was pushed up to B flat, they're above where they would normally be. So I would have, if I'd have known I was going to be in B flat, I would have written for oboes. If I'd known I was going to be in B flat, I wouldn't have written the strings so high, but it all worked, you know, so it was serendipity. Wow, I'd never Thank heard you. such a thing. It, so it didn't, uh, it didn't speed up the music no, I don't know how they did it. I mean, Trevor Horn, who produced it in his new book, has explained how he did it, which there was some sort of film, something that was used by movie editors that he appropriated, and he replaced the arrangement with uh, synthesized 
until the point where they could get it to actually sound like it should have done, and then they put back the original chart. I mean, it wasn't as simple as tweaking a knob and pushing the whole thing up a tone. or Well, a tone would have been a lot, but this is a tone and a half. It's insanity, you know. Are you a patient man? Yeah. Because I read that, uh, I saw that anecdote about the three-hour orchestral session with with Bjork that you know, she yeah. showed up at the last 10 minutes or something. And I can imagine that was a pretty tense situation with all those people sitting there and the clock running. It was, but the the amazing thing, obviously, because it's, you know, her singing live with a big band, first take, it's got that excitement of her first take with a big band. And there's no way... Well, there's no way we could have done it as a backing track with her singing on top of it. But also six takes and the whole level of excitement would have gone right down. So it was lucky in the end, although I, I could do without the, you know, showing up 10 minutes from the end. <laughs> that was... did, did, do you find that you have to be a bit of a psychiatrist in working with certain pop musicians? Mm. Definitely. I mean, there, it, it's very interesting sometimes when you're, particularly when you're doing things that are slightly out of their comfort zone, because although part of it is doing what you do and getting it right, and they've hired you because of what you do, the other part is reassuring them that they're not making a terrible mistake by by doing what they've decided to do. And the only real way to do that is is to make it as good and as pleasant as possible. So I think the old days of, which I, I know from people I've spoken to, of top session players, both here and in Los Angeles and New York, sort of laughing behind their hands at some of the things that they're working on. I could never, you know, I... I I had some terrible moments early on with, particularly with string sections, older string sections, who really, A, couldn't care less about what they were playing, and B, actually couldn't play it properly anyway, which is very bizarre. I, I wrote an arrangement on an early, well, I wrote an arrangement on an early record where I had a triplet figure going against the... 4-4 four, four rhythm, which really was very simple. It was like da 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 couldn't play it. And I couldn't believe it. They could not play it. And then the next time I wrote a string figure that jumped from one octave to like an octave above, plus I don't know, two notes or whatever it was. And they struggled to the point where one of the string players said to the leader, can we change the part? And the leader went mad and said, you play it as it's written. You don't mess about with it. So I was doing a session and at the back of the first violins was a 17 year old violinist who's now a big orchestral leader and conductor. And he called me over and he said, you don't have to put up with this. He said, let me put your sections together. I said, right, you know, next session, please, you you book it. From then on, I never had a problem. He he booked the most incredible section, young, eager, who actually knew the vocabulary and listened to the music they were recording. So it wasn't a case of jaded players looking at their watch, you know, upside down on their arm going, right, pack up, that's the end of the session, which we had, not on my session, but I saw it happen a viola player packing up in the middle of a take and walking out. Whoa. Unbelievable. Yeah, I had a, I had an instant like that once I'll briefly share doing a charts for a, a Elvis impersonator. And they oh, were, yeah. Yeah, and they were doing a Suspicious Minds, which has this brass part. Da, da, da. Very simple, right? Rock yeah. rhythm. And the fellows that were in the brass section were like old swing, swing guys. So it got to that part and they're going... Ba ba da, 
ba ba da and I'm going da da da. They they like it was foreign to them to just read yeah. the <laughs> No, you 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 have to be very careful about that. And I was very lucky because there was a whole generation of session players that were coming up when I went in really full pelt. And they sp they all spoke the same language. They listened to the same type of music. So if I wrote, because the worst thing that would happen in the early days was, oh yeah, I country and Western, I can play country and Western. Well, you can't because you're just playing what you think country and Western is. Or, oh, funk, yes, I know what funk is. No, hang on a minute, that's not what it is. And it's very difficult when you're actually trying to explain to someone that they're actually not correct. I mean, I, I, I still, when I book an orchestra, I'm very, very, I, I don't know what the word is, but I don't like to correct people and say, no, you're doing it wrong. Because I, I'd be offended if somebody said it to me. So I'm offended on their behalf of saying, excuse me, instead of doing this, could you do that? And luckily, it, I don't have to do that very often because everybody is on the same page, as it were. Yeah, I was envious of um, one of the many videos had you standing in front of a, a huge orchestra. And is there a difference for you? You said when I book an orchestra, which I'm assuming you're booking only the instrumentalist that you want, that you wrote for. So if you are get a commission to write for a full orchestra, have you ever had the issue of, there's more instruments here than I really need, but I better write something for the second bassoon because they've been sitting there for a long time. <laughs> I know what you mean. No, it, it never really comes up, you know, because if you're given the orchestral resource, I mean, for example, I, I wrote something for a, a community orchestra in the Midlands. And um, they said, well, we've got like 18 flute players or something like that, and one violin. So what you write is actually, you know, based on what their lineup is. And it's interesting because it, it then becomes a challenge. You think, well, what am I going to do with all these people? How, how am I going to, and the ones who can't actually play as well as the other ones, do I write the same thing for them? You know, so there are different challenges, but I've been so lucky because when I write for orchestra, if it's not my own selection of players, I've written for the LSO and for the Royal Philharmonic and the London Philharmonic and the Philharmonia and the Birmingham Symphony. So I know what I'm going to get. You know, I know, I know that whatever I write will be played exactly as I've written it. I'm not going to have to go in and say, hang on a minute, this is all wrong. <laughs> do, you ever, do you ever walk around the orchestra when they're rehearsing and you're hearing something that's awry? And oh, yeah. perhaps a copyist mistake? Totally. It happens, it happens quite frequently, you know, it, it's... It's not um, not so prevalent these days because now music copying is off Sibelius and uh, very rarely things go down incorrectly. I mean, I, I was always amazed to see uh, years ago Gil Evans' parts and there are mistakes still there on the parts. And so, oh, that, that's not right. You know, nobody's ever bothered to correct it. <laughs> so, maybe they did in their head, but they haven't corrected it on the on the paper. That makes but, me think someone I interviewed recently was talking about the Gil Evans sound and the fact, he, and he said, well, he wrote he wrote half steps in in the middle of the chord sometimes. And now I'm now I'm starting to think, well, maybe not on purpose. Well, it I I never forget. Um, uh, when he was rehearsing in London, the trumpet player said, Gil, uh, my part is a bit high. And Gil said to him, oh, play it two octaves lower then. <laughs> Wonderful. Am I correct that um, 
American film producers and directors often come to to London to record partly because it's more economically uh, feasible for them. That is a part of it because um, there are no residuals on film recording in the UK. So the big move, I mean, it's a double-edged thing. They think that, you know, the orchestras are better in London, they're quicker. Uh, their reading is quicker, their interpretation is quicker, but also there, um, there are no residuals. So that becomes a big thing in their thinking. Is it a uh, common in England for English films for the musicians to get credit and the scroll? It's it's starting to happen. It's happening a lot now. I think it's become a mandatory thing in American movies to credit the musicians. It, in my experience, there are directors who I've worked with who insist on crediting people, and there are who don't. I mean, I've just done a film. I think everybody's credited. I haven't seen it yet, but um, I I suspect everyone has been credited. Speaking of having haven't seen it yet, do you, at what point before the actual end of a film, do you get to see the film and the music together? And is there anything that you have the ability to say, uh, that's not what I had in mind? <laughs> well, usually you, you get to the cast and crew, you know. Uh, a very interesting one is actually Life of Brian. Um, excuse me, because I obviously I did the arrangement of Always Look on the Bright Side of Life that finishes the film. And I went to the preview and my whole arrangement, apart from the rhythm track, had vanished. All you could do was a saxophone solo and a trumpet solo. And, and being the last thing in the film, I was really looking forward to it. And I was really depressed. <laughs> I came out, oh dear, you know, but Okay, that's what they've chosen to do. I then got invited to the premiere and my whole arrangement had been put back. Everything. And it was years later I found out that uh, George Harrison, who produced the film, insisted that my arrangement be restored into the film. So thank you, George. Thank you, George. <laughs> Over here we have a term called train wrecks where things just go really badly? Is there anything oh. that pops into your head? Oh, God, not half. <laughs> so we were, we were doing the film Funny Bones, which is wonderful comedy with Jerry Lewis and uh, Oliver Platt, Lee Evans, Leslie Caron. And I had written basically an orchestral score with uh, two percussionists. And I had in mind uh, the Sound of Weather Report for the rhythm. So I booked uh, Alex Acuna and Michael Fisher in Los Angeles. And we couldn't find a studio. And we finally found one because they were we were ringing them up and saying, are you able to show PAL videos? PAL videos, of course, were British Standard, not NTSC. Pneumatics, but pal. And everywhere said, sorry, no, we can't do it. Uh, sorry. One studio said, yeah, no problem. So we showed up at the studio, and the first thing that the truck, it was in the basement. The truck with all the percussion couldn't get into the car park. That was the start. Uh, they started unloading stuff, and the studio was locked. So it all had to pile up in the car park. <laughs> then the guy turned up, not the engineer, but the guy who ran the studio turned up and he had a baseball cap on backwards, which I thought, oh, this is not going to go well. We actually, Finally, we got in and they couldn't, they'd never recorded a live instrument. They'd only plugged in guitars into the desk. So they couldn't get the microphone lead to stretch into the studio to clip onto the microphone to get it recorded. 
then we found out that have you got a pal video the guy thought he'd said have you got a video pal <laughs> and of course there wasn't a pal video in sight so we couldn't look at the film so the whole first session was attempting to stretch a lead to the microphone into the room with no picture whatsoever and at one point i i went outside and the engineer, very famous movie soundtrack engineer, and my producer were on, they, ha they had their heads on adjacent wheelie bins, sobbing, literally in tears. <laughs> and I went back in and the director was sitting at the back and he went, uh, it's all going terribly well. Uh, <laughs> Somehow we persuaded them to stay for another three hours and we actually got it going. And there was no orchestral track, obviously. This is pre the orchestra. And I had my timings. So they recorded to my timings. Then we got ready to take the tape back to London and the guy in the studio said, you've got a problem here because they haven't given you enough run up to synchronize the music to, to the film. So my producer on the last day when we were due to fly back to England, had to rush to a film facility where they inserted blank tape into the recording. And we got back to London thinking, well, you know, tough, we've, we've blown the whole thing. And it worked, <laughs> everything fitted. But that was just about the, the, that was the car crash. That was the car crash session. Talk about improvising. Oh, the other car crash session was for Elliot Lawrence, where um, it was a Ford commercial for uh, Super Bowl. And it was 20 minutes long. Uh, I think six films of four minutes that interspersed through the thing. And the Monday we were recording with the symphony orchestra. On the Friday afternoon, the engineer, the assistant editor phoned me, sorry, not the engineer. And he said, I think you've been sent the wrong tape. So I had a look at it and what he said was not the right tape. He was right, it was the wrong tape. And I said, well, how am I supposed to write? He said, well, I've just been fired. <laughs> So I can't help you. So obviously he'd done it in revenge because the, the guy, had, you know, the main editor had fired him. Oh. Uh, he gave me a phone number for the head of Ford or something like that, where the producer was spending the weekend in the Catskills. Or... <laughs> so I telephoned from London, you know, to the Catskills to say, I think I've got the wrong, you sent me the wrong tape. And the guy was obviously sitting with the boss. So he was going, oh, no, 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 no problem at all. I'm going, yes, there is a problem. I can't write because I've got the wrong, I haven't got any sync points. Yes, well, that's great. You know, we'll, you, we look forward to hearing it on Monday. I'm going, no, you don't understand. I can't do it. And he's covering the phone. And <laughs> anyway, he hangs up and in comes Elliot Lawrence with the guy from the agency. And I rang and said, Elliot, we've got a big problem. Um, you know, we can't really do it because it's all wrong. And he said, well, a couple of them are right, so just do them. I said, okay, so we get to the studio <laughs> and we do the ones that are correct. And I go up to the control room and there's the boss of the agency and Elliot Lawrence, and they're going, oh, this reminds me of the time we did the so-and-so commercial and they sent the wrong film. <laughs> and what about the time this happened? <laughs> and I'm I'm sweating, you know, because I couldn't do it. And they're laughing it off. And then at the end of the week, we got the correct cuts and we did the rest of it, you know, and it went on. But, oh, I, I aged about 10 I years. Gonna, I was going to say <laughs> that ages you. <laughs> That's fascinating stuff. Um, oh, just a couple more things here. You were... It, made a statement i believe you were talking about uh the song rock around the clock yes 
that there was uh, very little teenage music before that. Mm. I'm fascinated by the transition from what we'll call swing into rock. And it's always struck me that rock around the clock is actually a swing tune. Oh, totally. And I, I got to, which I think you, I probably mentioned or um, you might know when, when they had 50 years of blackboard jungle, I got to play with the original comets. So it's basically everybody who was on the original record, apart from Bill Haley and my friend Billy Gussack, who played drums, because they reckon that the drummer, Dick, sped up. So they wanted someone to keep the, the tempo. Anyway, so it was basically the original band that toured with Bill Haley. And they played Shake, Rattle and Roll. Franny Beecher was a great jazz guitarist. Joey Ambrose, great jazz tenor player. Marshall Little, you know, they're, they're all swing musicians, Western swing. And they swung like crazy. I mean, I got to play on two or three numbers, but their basic repertoire with Rock Around the Clock and Shake, Rattle and Roll and all these things were Western swing. They're absolutely. And the whole rhythmic feel was totally different to that so da, 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 rock and roll thing that, that everybody thought straight eights. It was swing. And it was so infectious. It was incredible. And you could say, yeah, this is why they succeeded. You know, it, it, it was in that tradition. It was swing. It's very interesting. Yeah, when you so you when you watch videos of people doing the Lindy Hop at the Savoy, there's really not that much difference from what Bill Haley's that that swing Western swing feel was happening. Absolutely, I I agree. I mean, I, and that's I, I particularly noticed it when they played Shake Rattle and Roll, because you get your perception of what it sounded like with Joe Turner, and then what it sounded like later. And this was down another path. This was, this really was Western Swing, which of course Joe Turner wasn't. Joe was R&B. And the Western Swing feel is different from the R&B feel. Mm -hmm. So it's, it, was, it was very interesting to, to get that. Yeah. And to play with it, it was marvelous. That, when you get up from this session, uh, will music, uh, a task, a musical task, come back into your head? I'm sure it will. I mean, I've, I've just done some charts. I've got a big band gig coming up in a couple, well, two coming up in a couple of weeks. So I've just continued what I've been doing, which is adapting hit records that I've had into big band settings. So I know nobody else is going anywhere near them. <laughs> I wanted I wanted to make a, a a comment that I was watching a video of you in a big band and you were playing an I wish I wish I knew. Oh yeah. And you were playing your curved soprano. And I just wanted you to know that your quote in your solo of Honeysuckle Rose was noticed. Uh, well, that's good, yes. I mean some, sometimes you well, I mean, quotes that are, are sort of, uh, I'm not, I'm not on Sonny Rollins sort of level of quotes. <laughs> but it's an interesting process because you have to realize how do I fit this particular tune into this particular, oh, totally. tune, right? It's a, it's a mental gymnastics sort of thing. Oh, yeah. Well, the great, the great one is, um, uh, oh no, it, it's one of the Christmas numbers that, that, um, Chet Baker plays June in January, and I, I'm trying to remember which one. Oh, but it's uh, it's quite st startling, you know. So Paul Desmond, master of that. Oh it? yes, your career has gone from uh, splicing tape and using a pencil and pad to today, where things seem to change almost every year. Mm. Are there positive and negatives for you? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I still try to put, if I'm composing, 
ideas down on paper and then transfer them to the computer. Um, when I'm arranging, lately I've done a lot more, although I'm I'm sort of sketching stuff out, a lot more of the basic work I've been doing on on the on the computer rather than on manuscript. But um I'd like to say I miss that old way of doing it, but I, I don't think I really miss it. I, mean, I don't think that's the right sentence. You know, it's it all, all that drudgery, plus the fact that I wound up in the position where I couldn't read my own writing. So I don't know how anyone else did. It's got worse and worse. My my copyist used to say I can read your musical stuff, but it's the it's the directions and I don't have a clue what you've written. <laughs> Make a guess at does that say Adagio or Allegro or what what does it say? <laughs> does that say pal or does that say something else? That's it, yes. <laughs> have you got a video, pal? <laughs> um, oh, last question. Of all the things you've done from going into clubs and sitting in to standing in front of a 60-piece orchestra, is there a, a through line through that? Is there something that is always a constant for you? E, I mean, I, 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 I just totally enamored of, of making music in some way. So to stand in front of my quartet and play I Wish I Knew or uh, Obscure Standard is just as exciting as, as doing a downbeat in front of the London Symphony Orchestra. It's a different excitement, I guess, but uh, it's still it's still an extension of exactly where I was when I started, which is, you know, not a lot of people can say that. Uh, the, the one thing that when when I saw my uncle a lot when he moved to America and I was in America and um, he was basically conducting for Milton Berle and Anthony Newley and Don O'Connor and, you know, doing a lot of variety stuff. And he said to me, he was a great trombone player, recorded with Coleman Hawkins in the 30s. And he said, have you given up playing yet? And I said, no. He said, you will. I said, no, I won't. So it made, it made me more determined to keep the playing going because he put his trombone behind the chair and forgotten about it. And that's, I, th I guess, a lot of arrangers' lot, isn't it, that they they stop playing because they, they just don't have the time to devote to it. I mean, I, I stopped playing flute and clarinet, possibly for that reason, but I never wanted to stop playing saxophone or playing in public or, you know, having a, a jazz group or using the jazz brain. I'd like to think that that's important, um, that that you're still connected in a physical way to the players who are making your music come alive and you still know what it feels like. Oh, I, oh I'm always conscious of it. Particularly, you know, the interesting thing was somebody said, why, why don't you feature yourself more with your big band? And I said, because there are five saxophone players who are better than me, and I want to hear them. You know, I don't mind playing three numbers in the whole show. You know, that's fine. As long as I can hear some of these brilliant players and I, I had a big band in LA and a big band in Australia and one in the UK, and they're all fantastic. You know, when you when you've got Pete Christley or P Plaz Johnson or Bob Efford sitting there, you're not going to hog every solo. There's no way. You know, or Lenny Morgan. You know, you're, you're, this is insanity to think. Oh well, you know what? I'm going to feature myself now. Never mind all those people. Well, I suspect you're running out of room in your house for the mementos and, and awards, <laughs> and all that. Yeah. It's been a fascinating conversation, and I'm very appreciative of your time. Well, it's been my pleasure. I've thoroughly enjoyed it. Excellent. So I'll just uh, pause us here, and we'll say our goodbyes. Thanks, John. Yeah.